You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. So today is going to be a little bit of a grab baggy kind of cleanup sort of thing. Got a couple little notesy things. Got some uh, messages and whatnot to get through. So that's what we're doing today. Thank you to the folks who are uh, keeping the iTunes reviews coming. Much appreciated. Stand by what I said, by the way. If we get to 300 before the season starts, giving away a Game Pass subscription. It's not going to happen. I'm just reminding everybody. Just just throw it out there. Also, if you have any questions, 608-501-0718, text or call. And make sure you get into the Facebook group, because that's kind of just where stuff goes down, man. If and when things do go down. If you want to know what I mean by that, I guess you got to get in the Facebook group. But let's take our break and uh, start talking about stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. So the first thing I want to talk about is I get the impression that people are just smarter than me. <laughs> and, and I'm just getting played all the time. We all are. If you remember not very long ago, hold on, alarm's going off. Every time I do the show, there's an alarm going off, and it's like, oh, this is the one that doesn't have cool music going. But if you remember a couple months ago, there was a thing where Russell Wilson, right before he's about to, you know, have these contract talks or whatever with his team, starts generating some rumors. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be coming from Russell Wilson, but, I mean, of course it had to at some level. Him and or his agent and or his wife starts spilling out these rumors that they want to leave. Like, real bad. We want to go to New York, which is a convenient excuse. And it's like this real big thing, and it's, oh man, I wonder if you're going to get traded, and it's going to be crazy. So the Seattle Seahawks start freaking out, and they're like, we got to get a good package. We got to figure out a really good amount of money to try to get him to stay, because he doesn't want to stay here anymore. So they come out with this big deal. And there's speculation, like, no, he he wants 40. And if he hits the open market, which he will, he's going to get 40. 40 a year. And I'm sitting here going, no way. Like, that's not possible. No team could do it. But what if it happened? Like, you just never know, man. Seattle comes to him and they're like, all right, four years, 140 
of that 140, you get a $65 million signing bonus, $5 million in base salary this year, so $70 million bucks, boom, this year. 107 of the 140 is guaranteed. What do you think, man? Any chance you'll stay with us? And he just goes, yeah, that sounds good, and signs it. He, he wasn't going anywhere. He lied. He played the Seahawks. He played all of us. They didn't want to go anywhere. They're fine. They're happy. They're filthy rich. He just wanted a big contract. His agent's like, hey, how about we do this thing where it's like, you know, whatever. And he just played us all like a bunch of dummies, and I fell for it. And guess what? I did it again. We all did it again. I don't know if you saw this, and and bear in mind, maybe some of these things are true. Maybe Russ did want to go. Maybe Robbie Gold really does love Chicago. I don't know. But I've been hearing all along, like he just he wants to go to Chicago. He's he's see that's where he's going. He loves it there. His family's there. All this stuff. Like we're going. I thought no chance in the world. Not only is he not playing for the 49ers, I, I just thought, guaranteed, he's he's going to Chicago. Well, San Francisco comes to the table with a four-year, $19 million contract, $10.5 million this year, guaranteed, which is all of his guarantees, which is funny because it's like, well, I mean, the only reason he signed is because he got a four-year deal, so he can move his family over and everything's going to be... Dude, he's out of guarantees after year one. This isn't a four-year, I mean, it's it's a four-year contract, but it's not a four-year contract. I mean, it is if he keeps kicking well, probably, but it's still going to be pretty expensive to keep him. I'm just saying, as soon as he signed it, it was like, oh, it's that thing again. The thing where you say, I want out, I want to move, I, you know, I got family, we got a career, I just, you know, I love it here and all, but we think we're just going to pack it up and go, so we won't be signing any contracts here. As much as I love you guys, it's just, just, it's just not football anymore. It's, it's something else, and, and it's about family, and, you know, I just want to support my wife, and I want to be there with my kids, and how about this contract? Done. Deal. Boom, sucker. <laughs> Let's go, kids. Which, not only is that awesome, because now Robbie Gold is not going to be a bear, which I would have said almost, I mean, I thought it was weird we didn't keep hearing about it, because I thought for sure he was going to be a Chicago Bear. There was just no doubt in my mind. Because I believed the part where Robbie Gold was saying, I want to go and play in Chicago. I don't want to be here anymore. It's not about the money. Just let me go. And then as soon as he hits the open market, the Bears are going to throw a ton of money at him. He would take a massive discount just to stay there. And instead, the 49ers offer him $4.7 million, which is kind of trash money. They're like, how about, you know, four, four and a half million a year? Yeah, that's perfect. Great. Sounds good. Really? Yeah, no, no, that's fine. That's, sounds good. But get this, $10 million this year. No, 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 yeah, I already said yeah. No, it's fine. I don't care. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> but then he gets a layer deeper. Now, I'm, again, I'm not saying the guy's lying because apparently I haven't been listening very long. He's had Aaron Rodgers number one for a very long time. But I wake up this morning and there's a new podcast sitting there. And, you know, sometimes early on it's like, oh, let's see if I can squeeze a couple minutes in real quick of a podcast. The very top one, Chris Sims podcast, and the, the title just says Aaron Rodgers. Start listening to it. Essentially, Aaron Rod, you know, Aaron Rodgers had the golf tournament thing, whatever he was doing, and it just so happens that Chris Sims had plans of being there, and it just so happens that just shy of him taking a trip in which he's going to be shoulder to shoulder with Aaron Rodgers, he decides to release a top 10 list of quarterbacks where he can say Aaron Rodgers is the best quarterback in the NFL. Again, maybe I'm giving people too much credit, but as soon as I heard that he had plans of being there in hopes of getting Aaron Rodgers, when he said on the podcast, I've been trying for three years to get an interview with this guy and I haven't been able to, it just feels a little too perfect. Again, kudos to him. I didn't think the interview went very well because Chris Sims, who I would have said on every other episode, if anything, is way too arrogant. I mean, it's fine. It's a, it's a fine podcast. It's it's There's nothing wrong with it. But you listen to him talk to Aaron Rodgers, and it's just the most cringeworthy thing since Winston Moss and his little tour. But anyways, I like to be able to see things coming, and I've been missing these little... Whatever. It's frustrating. But it's fine. He probably does think Aaron Rodgers is the top quarterback, and maybe this was just a coincidence. I just don't think it was. And for the third time this year, 
pe- people are just using us, man. Actually, us has nothing. They, they, we're not in this, but I, I, I put us in this, so we are important now. Hey, Robbie Gold did use the Bears fans, so there you go. Just, just trampled all over their feels. No, I love them. I want to be with them. I love Bears fans. They're great. How about four million bucks sold? <laughs> oh, that that made me smile a lot. Robbie, you the man. But anyways, as much as the, I mean, you know, go listen to it if you want to listen to it. I didn't care for really any of it. But there was this tiny little part in the middle that, um, as much as I feel secure in the fact that there's nothing wrong with LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers, and there isn't, hearing Aaron Rodgers talk about how enamored he is with the offense got me a little bit excited. Because I, I, I don't really know. I don't, I don't know what Aaron Rodgers thinks of the offense. You know, he's said things already like you know this this is cool and but it's also been like sort of backhanded like I don't know if you recall when LaFleur was showing these different plays of like how our offense works and Aaron Rodgers kind of made a crack like yeah I mean he put together a highlight reel of like you know the few times it worked and I mean that's cool but kind of make a highlight reel out of anything so I mean I don't think it's going to be exactly that easy so I just I, I don't know but I wanted to take a little piece of that and play it for you because well I'm guessing you haven't heard it yet, but if you haven't, like most people probably haven't, you can uh, hear it here first. All right, so you excited about LaFleur and everything? I am excited about it. Um, I am too. The the most important thing with change is is embracing it and being comfortable with the uncomfortable parts of it. Because, you know, when you've been in the system for so long, you have a way of doing things. And the first part is being open to it. And that's, you know, that's what I told them day one. I said, I want to be coached. You know, I'm excited about right. the opportunities. The scheme works. Yeah. You look around, the scheme works. Oh, I know. I mean, in my buddy's Kyle, Kyle Shanahan. Shanahan right. Right. I know. He's I know. a genius. I mean, yeah. the stuff they did against us this year right? in San Francisco was unbelievable? unbelievable. How they get people open? We're watching on Saturdays going, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I know. They it cracked works. the code yeah. on defenses a lot. And it's been fun. It really has been fun. I mean, yes. I got a great room. I got him in the room. I got... I got Nathaniel Hackett, yep, who's I know been on the game forever. Right. Who's a great guy. Yeah. And I got Luke Getze, who uh-huh. I've known for a long time. Okay. So life's good. Yeah. It's, it's exciting. So he goes on from there to talk about the audibling stuff, which he kind of says the same stuff. But, def, you know, I'd, I'd probably go check it out. Chris Sims' uh, unbuttoned podcast, if you're not listening to it. I do like it. But, you know, I, I feel like especially this time of year, all year, but this time of year when there's nothing going on, it's really about trying to read between the lines. And most of the stuff that I hear is is garbage. I mean, including from players, it's just kind of garbage. You know, even the Devontae stuff talking about, oh, this guy's real good, this guy's, you know, yeah, maybe. Because I don't even think Devontae knows at this point. You know, I mean, what, what did he glean from seeing Darnell Savage for, like, those two days, not even wearing helmet pads, nothing, just running around, like running around cones, like, oh, he's going to be a freak this year. I mean, that's cool, and I'm glad, and I'm kind of being a little unfair i'm sure he saw more than that but i'm just saying like i'm not putting my chips down on that i'm not you know maybe maybe i'll put like one of those little chips down there over there but the the cool thing about this and and you know by the way the reason that sounded so weird he was walking with him his his interview came walking with him from hole to hole as he was playing golf so wind is picking up he's out of breath which kind of i thought was weird i mean (laughs) i don't know it, it, golfing can be pretty exhausting, but to hear Aaron Rodgers not be able to catch his breath because he's walking, I was like, come on, man. Are you doing a little bit of treadmill work? What's going on here? Maybe he's a brisk walker. I don't know. But the the point at which I got excited was when he's talking about LaFleur and the offense because, again, it's, it's you're trying to listen to his tone and, and you know, he doesn't sound ex- – he sounded exciting when he was talking about Kyle Shanahan and watching the 49ers offense because that was – you know, there's always been this, this – thought among fans or whatever that Aaron Rodgers wished he had maybe a different coach wish we were running something more modern but you don't really ever you're never gonna hear Aaron Rodgers go to the podium and go man I wish we were doing what what San Francisco was doing but you get to hear it now even though he didn't exactly say it that way you kind of get a peek behind the curtain of Aaron Rodgers during that 49ers game sitting on the sideline watching Kyle Shanahan's offense which, again, the 49ers weren't even that good of a team. They didn't have Garoppolo. There was a lot that was just missing from that team at that point. But still, Aaron Rodgers watching that offense and just being enamored with it and just going, wow, look at that. Look how they do this. Look how they run that. And now he has that offense. Now he has LaFleur running that. 
and he, you can just hear the the excitement. And now it's it's not super over the moon, but it's just a question of does he actually buy in? And I feel like, at, at least insofar as him knowing and and respecting the offense, that's there. Because again, that that when I say that there is a potential problem between Rodgers and Lafleur, the the problem is going to come number one if the Packers aren't winning. If they're winning, it doesn't matter. Not, there's no problem. But if they're not winning, the the question is really going to come into as Aaron Rodgers said, it comes down to trust, and that's true. But the problem is Aaron Rodgers has also high expectations. So trust and expectations sometimes diverge from each other each other how much trust am i going to put in you when i have a high expectation that you're not able to meet how long am i going to allow trust to take over and and allow my expectations to take take a back seat i think his appreciation of this style of offense allows a little bit more leeway to where aaron Rodgers understands that this offense does work and if it takes a little time and if i'm a little bit patient with it this thing's gonna you know sort of like the um run the table comment It's a matter of, you know, things aren't necessarily working now, but I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I just think that carries a lot of weight. And it just also gets me excited about the possibilities that this thing's just going to kick off from the start. And and that's the other thing I'd I'd mentioned before. It's as much as I feel like this is going to take time, right? Maybe even in year one, it's not going to be fully developed. Maybe we got to see what happens in year. But again, look at what happened with Sean McVay when he went over there. It was instant. Look what happened when Kyle Shanahan and Matt LaFleur went to the Falcons. I mean, they were always a pretty good offense. That was the most dominant offense we've seen in the last five years. Less the 2018. <laughs> Forget about 2018. Prior to 2018, in the probably the Rams and the, the Chiefs. I mean, don't forget how good that offense was, though. Sounds like I'm exaggerating, but that was just an unbelievably dominant offense. That was Kyle Shanahan, year one. The the Andy Reid tree, like I said, it, and that's why I say it's it's... There's a lot goes into a coach being a coach, but I also think there's something to be said about just bringing in this offense to a team. It just works by itself. How much it works, how long it works, whether or not it's a win or loss, that kind of comes down to the the coach in, in and of himself and his ability to game plan, call plays, adjust, all that stuff. But as far as just coming in and making it work, look at Matt Nagy in Chicago. It wasn't the most dominant offense in the world, but he despite the fact, and I think this really points to Matt Nagy, that there's a discrepancy between, well, his stats went from garbage to amazing, how can you say his play didn't improve? Well, if his play didn't improve, and if I am correct about that, and if Pro Football Focus and basically advanced statistics that look at your accuracy, if that's all true and he didn't improve, how did his stats improve so much? That's Matt Nagy in this offense. That's a modern offense that's being run that works. And, and, you know, interestingly enough, there are other coaches that come from the Andy Reid tree. Now, not many as successful as what you see as the last three that have come up, but Sean McDermott is another one. Now, I think the Buffalo Bills, and that was kind of garbage, but if you listen, there was another podcast, I don't remember which one, but they were talking about they thought Sean McDermott was a top 10 coach because of what he did given what he had. Ron Rivera, Andy Reid guy, and then the same guys I've been talking about, Doug Peterson. Look what he's done with the Eagles. It's incredible. And again, how, how do you do... That much, as I said yesterday, looking at the coaches or the the quarterbacks, I think Carson Wentz is a good quarterback, but I really think a lot of that is the scheme, and I think that's evidenced by the fact that he gets hurt. Nick Foles, who I I think has has had some success, but he's not a Super Bowl caliber quarterback, comes into the playoffs, plays out of his mind, and they win a Super Bowl. I'm putting a lot of that on Doug Peterson, and again, there was no there's no learning curve. He came in and the team was awesome. Frank Reich. In his first year, takes this team that's, you know, they've, they've always had this quarterback who's got injury issues, but he's pretty good, and you got T.Y., and otherwise the, the defense and the, uh, the offense are just kind of garbage. Well, he was the offensive coordinator for Doug Peterson. Now, every one of these guys has a little bit of extra influence, right? They've played for other coaches. They have other things going on. But fundamentally, the offense comes from what? Frank Reich learned from Doug Peterson, learned from Andy Reid. Frank Reich goes there and, and just turns the Colts into a powerhouse. And then again, Matt Nagy, when I, th- I think it was after Doug Peterson left, Matt Nagy stepped up and was Reed's offensive coordinator. The Chiefs continue to dominate. They pluck Matt Nagy, and it's kind of like, oh, well, you know, well, why do you keep taking their offensive coordinators? Obviously, it's just Andy Reed doing it because it's, and again, this is nothing against Matt Nagy. I think he's a good coach, and I think things are going to continue to go well for the Bears, at least insofar as the, the offense isn't just going to tank. He's going to continue to do a good job running the offense as best as he can, is what I'm saying. 
But again, it's just a matter of, so what? Just use the, the Andy Reid offense. It's going to work. It, it's going, And that's what I'm talking about with the Packers. It's going to bring them up to a certain level. How high it goes is going to be dependent on, on Matt LaFleur to some extent. But even if you bring it up to some level, given that Aaron Rodgers is the quarterback, it just... And I'm trying to protect myself a little bit. I'm trying to protect me and all of you by not getting super crazy with, with projections and predictions. But I, it's just... It, if If it's true that the Packers are just going to be brought back up to where the team is, is at zero, right? It's, 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 again, they're running this modern offense back like when, you know, Mike McCarthy had, you know, I don't know if it was ever really cutting edge, but it was the offense, right? It worked. And with Aaron Rodgers running it, it was probably the best offense in the league for a number of years. And that was good enough to get us into the playoffs and make a run in the, in the playoffs and culminated to at least one Super Bowl championship. And let's also f- not forget that as much as it seems ridiculous that a first-year head coach is going to come in, you're going to get into the playoffs and win a Super Bowl, um, Matt Nagy and Frank Reich, both in their first year, both turned garbage franchises around, took them both to the, to the playoffs, and both of them had very real chances of winning Super Bowls, despite the Bears not really having a quarterback. I guess what I'm saying here is there's a good chance that Matt LaFleur, and, and as far as being... And look, again, if, if there's anybody capable in the entire NFL of running a Kyle Shanahan offense, it's, it's Matt LaFleur. And if you look at Matt Nagy and the amount of time he spent studying under Andy Reid, it's incredible. It's, it's since, I think, 2012. I'm sorry, not 20. That's ridiculous. It was way before that. Matt Nagy started as a coaching intern for the Philadelphia Eagles in 2008. That's when Andy Reid was the head coach. 2010, he became coach's assistant. Uh, 2011, offensive quality control coach. Andy Reid takes the job with the Kansas City Chiefs. He brings um, Matt Nagy over with him as, with a promotion to quarterbacks coach. Then he goes in 2016 to offensive coordinator. So he, he is just a, a straight-up Andy Reid disciple from day one. He's never known anything but Andy Reid as a head coach. And again, that's, that's proven to be a winning formula. And it is something for us to get excited about. There are no guarantees. Things aren't automatically going to be awesome but I'm, I'm just saying just just look at the formula there there is a way to beat NFL defenses today and a lot of teams have figured it out and I think only a few are are refusing to transform and Mike McCarthy was one of them again today's NFL offenses beat the defense by taking what the defense gives you right you you for example, the, the whole, we line up the same way every time we run different plays, right? We're, we're trying to take advantage of you doing the wrong things. If, if you go left, we go right. If you go right, we go left, right? We're, we're manipulating you to the point where we're, we're trying to trick you and, and get guys wide open. Mike McCarthy and some of the older school guys, I think we're more, we take what we want type coaches. And the fact of the matter is with the NFL, de- the, the NFL defenses are, despite seeing all these crazy statistics and everything else, because, you know, certain teams are already ahead of defenses. Defenses have gotten so good. And if you're trying to line up and say, we're just going to beat you with, with strength and pie, it's just not going to work, man. It's just we're, we're going to mismatch you with our tight. No, man, li- look, linebackers slash safety types, they've taken that away. Defensive coordinators are too good to just line up and, and basically telegraph what we're going to do, but say, you know what, we're going to tell you what we're doing, but it doesn't matter because we're so good we're going to beat you anyways. No, you're not. Teams that are winning today are teams that are just saying, you can't win with us. Because, again, we're, we're just going to manipulate you. If, if, if the linebackers move this way, we're going that way. If you guys move that way, we're going this way. If the safeties are up, we're doing this, we're doing that. It's just, it just becomes a, a system in which you don't have enough guys, right? And, again, it, it's just exciting because, you know, that's just my perspective. But to hear Aaron Rodgers on the sideline watching the 49ers, watching Kyle Shanahan, the exact – well, not exact, but the, basically from a foundational standpoint, the exact same offense that he is now running, prior to him even knowing he was going to be running this offense, was watching the 49ers just with his jaw on the floor going, wow, that's really impressive what they're doing. That part of the interview got me excited. Anyways, let's take one more break, and then I'll get to one, maybe two questions. We'll see how it goes. So Kyler from Wyoming says, do you think Aaron Rodgers is regressing as a player, but fa- Packer fans don't want to admit it? Um, I think if it wasn't for pro football focus, I would probably lean toward yes. 
With that said, however, it's still a potential issue. When you look at what other people have said, and even what I've seen, there are questionable things. And there, there are, I remember in 2015 watching, and that was, again, <laughs> not, not saying I'm just saying, but that was around the Olivia Munn time. And things just went south. I, it was kind of inexplicable. Now, I've explained it since then that it was the whole Denver Broncos thing. But there was something about Aaron Rodgers. He was missing guys that were open. Just just certain things that you're looking at it going, dude, what is going on with Aaron Rodgers? This this is supposed to be the best quarterback in the history of the world, right? Super great. Doesn't miss easy throws of wide open receivers. And he was just airmailing all his passes. Now, that wasn't really the problem in 2018. But there were still times you're looking at it specifically at Rodgers going, what is wrong with you? And, you know, I, I don't remember where I just saw it, but somebody had mentioned that there's problems with his mechanics and with his timing and all that kind of stuff. I, I don't know. I'm not a quarterback. I'm not going to pretend to be. I, I don't know what proper mechanics would be. Even if I did, I would probably look at it and go, that's not proper mechanics. But Aaron Rodgers usually does pretty well when he's not using proper mechanics. Which, you know, again, if you just listen to what he said in this past interview with Chris Sims, he was talking about that. Where, you know, Brett Favre would be technically, th- you know, quote-unquote, throwing off his back foot. And Aaron Rodgers is like, no, he's not throwing off his back foot. That's proper form as far as how you generate power as you're rolling to your left, right? A, a a proper analysis of form and, and, you know, what you would teach high school kids would say this is not the proper way to throw. But when you're kind of next level elite quarterback in the NFL, best in the league or whatever, you kind of do next level stuff like that. That's, you know, that's eighth degree black belt quarterbacking. But, uh, you know, one of the things I just said, I just did an interview with um, uh, Zach Pearson over at the Bear Report podcast. And I kind of mentioned how things were going south for the Packers for a while, and we were all kind of in denial a little bit, right? And 2018 is when all that kind of came to a head. The scariest thing about this year, as exciting as it is, and and as much as I believe in it, and I think Aaron Rodgers is going to thrive in it, it's, it's one of those things where if things go south, it's scarier than it was last year. Last year, we had a million excuses. You know, Mike Pettin was in his first year. You know, some of our key guys were injured. Aaron Rodgers was injured. Uh, Mike McCarthy's system was no good. The wide receivers were young and inexperienced and didn't know what they were doing. Millions of excuses. We now have Matt LaFleur. We now have a modernized offense. We have Mike Pettin in his second year. Mike Pettin went out and got all of his guys, right? We, we got rid of the Dom Capers guys, brought in Mike Pettin type guys. We got new pass rushers. We got new safeties. We drafted an offensive lineman and paid big money to an offensive lineman that Aaron Rodgers has been bragging up for a long time, Mr. Billy Turner. I mean, just just the excuses are gone, man. And if Aaron Rodgers is going out there and he's missing open guys and he's not throwing to open guys and he's trying to do things that he's not supposed to do and he's and he's not doing things that he's supposed to do and he's supposed to get the ball out and he's scrambling too much and he's trying to make these crazy plays and he's like, dude, just play the way you're supposed to play and he's just not able to do it. I, I guess what I'm saying is as of right now, I'm not going to go there. If he has a bad year and it, it, it it's going to be more or less his fault. Right, because because again, all the exp- excuses are gone, and that's also where I've said, you know, there, there's only a very very small contingent of Packer fans saying we need a new quarterback. Right, wait until you see how viciously, violently horrible Packers Twitter, Packers Facebook, whatever is going to be if the Packers have another bad year. Um, unless Aaron Rodgers is playing out of his mind and the defense is just garbage, like has happened in the past, where it's it's nobody can blame Aaron Rodgers. If the offense isn't going, just wait to see what people have to say. Especially in a year with all these talented quarterbacks, there's going to be a very large contingent of people who want to trade Aaron Rodgers, get multiple first-round picks for him, draft a young guy like Jake Fromm if he decides to come out or whoever, you know, trade up and get Justin Herbert or Tua or whatever. You know, especially prior to, can you imagine if, if, you know, let's say the Packers were drafting at, you know, I don't know, 12 again. How many people are going to scream, trade him, get two first-round picks this year, trade up to number one, get Tua, and let's go after this thing. Tua Tagovailoa with Matt LaFleur's offense. People are going to freak out, man. Now, I don't want to ever get to that point. I don't want to have to sit here and make a determination what side I fall on. I want to be on the Aaron Rodgers side because Aaron Rodgers is doing great and there's nothing to worry about. The offense got 10, 11, 12 wins. We got into the playoffs. Maybe we got a Super Bowl championship. Maybe we just got, you know, we won the wild card or whatever and we got knocked out. But, hey, we're close and it's we got to see a spark. And, man, this is for real. And this defense is only going to get better and, and the offense is going to get better. It's going to be awesome. 
But that is a worry of mine. If things go south, what's going to happen to the fan base? What are we going to say? What are we going to do? Because, again, everybody's locked up. Aaron Rodgers is locked up. Um, you know, getting rid of him is going to cost a ton of money. The, the, the guys that we just signed, you know, Adrian Amos, he's locked up. Zadarius and Preston, four-year contracts. Billy Turner, he's locked up. You know, Gary and Savage and, and all these guys that we drafted, if they're no good, we're stuck with these guys. They're not going anywhere. And, you know, again, if things go south, we're essentially looking at a team that has a GM that can't draft, a head coach that maybe isn't what he was billed to be, a quarterback that can't do it anymore. I mean, we're done, man. And I hate to go from super high highs to super low lows, but I, this is all hypothetical. And again, I'm looking at it and I'm saying everything seems to be lined up right. You know, everything that needed to be done. I thought maybe this was going to be a multi-year rebuild. All the issues that were prevalent issues are taken care of. And, and kudos to Brian Gutekunst for going out and taking care of business, right? He, he came in. If you're not our guy, he was cutting people as the season was going on. He got rid of the coach. He got rid of everybody. He rehired a whole bunch of staff, filled a bunch of holes. We're good to go, right? We'll see. And again, you know, it's... Again, if things go south, you're going to start hearing and seeing some pretty ugly things, and there's going to be some tough conversations that need to be had. And again, as far as Kyler's question, I think it's a little premature. Um, you know, again, you look at PFF; it was it was one of his better years according to them. It seems ridiculous because he needed to hit the checkdowns and things of that nature. But you know, let, let's not get too hung up in that. He had some great throws, some great moments with an injured leg. Very, very limited. Again, you look at the wide receiver grades; it tells the whole picture. Nobody outside of Devontae was, was graded out as doing anything at all. No more Jordy. Cobb was not doing anything. Uh, they, they had no respect for Equinemius, no respect for Marquez, no respect for Geronimo. They were watching it going, the wide receivers are just no good. And then you factor in Mike McCarthy calling ridiculous plays, not really getting a ton of help from the run game despite having a good running back because we're just not calling run plays. You know, third and two, let's call an all-go. It just, it just, it's, Again, it just was dysfunctional. It just didn't work. It, it didn't make sense. There was no process behind it. So let's let's just let's just see what happens. Let's stick with optimism for now. I mean, I definitely understand the concerns. It, essentially, since 2015, Aaron Rodgers, at least statistically, has only had one good year. But again, 2015 was an off year for Rodgers. 2016 was fine. 4,400 yards, 40 touchdowns, seven interceptions, 140, 104.2 passer rating. It was fine. 2017, he got injured. I thought he started the season really well. It looked like the Packers were going to be pretty dominant. He ends up getting injured. 2018, the entire offense fell apart. You know, 4,400 yards, 25 touchdowns, two interceptions, 97.6 passer rating. It, you know, his completion percentage dropped to uh, 62.3. But, you know, it was 60.7 in 2015. He bounced back with a 65.7 uh, completion percentage the next year. That's not quite what he was, you know, if you look at 2010, 11, 12, or, or 13 even where that was kind of the norm, and 65 was kind of the the, the bottom, the lower end. But again, I, I think the whole offense has been trending downward, and we've been cutting talent and not really replacing it, which is still a work in progress. We're going to have to reload. We're going to have to get some more stuff on offense, but it's going to take some time, right? You can't lose Jordy and, you know, and Cobb and your half your offensive line and then say, okay, go to cunts, replace everybody right now. Like, no, man, it's going to take time, but we'll see. We'll see what happens this year. Again, everything that we need to have happen, everything that that could have happened to point to having a much better year and being right back on track in one year, it's there. We get we got the coach that's going to modernize the offense. We need that. And, and which coach is available that that's most likely to be able to actually run this new offense? It's Matt Lafleur. I mean, nobody has more experience in this style of offense that that was an available head coach that I'm aware of than Matt Lafleur. And again, I I, I just. I, I'm, I'm having a hard time, as much as conceptually I can see where there would be a problem and Aaron Rodgers is still looking the same, because it just felt like that was kind of the new norm and I was a little bit nervous, like, man, maybe Rodgers just is, doesn't have it anymore. I just don't see a situation, honestly, where this new offense comes in, Matt LaFleur is able to scheme guys open, and Rodgers just can't find him, can't hit him. I just don't see it, man. I just don't see it happening. Aaron Rodgers hasn't had wide open receivers in four years. I mean, Devontae gets a little open sometimes. Marquez gets some space sometimes. But nine times out of ten, there's just nobody. Nobody. And how frustrating it is to see guys run their routes and just stand there with corners just standing next to them like, nope, not going this way. And then when it breaks down, like, I don't know what to do. Maybe I'll just stand here and be like, come on, throw it to me. I'll probably get it. 
It just just didn't work, man. But again, optimism. We'll be all right. Well, I think I'm going to cut it there. You folks have yourselves a fantastic Tuesday. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.